God's preparation for Jesus. The birth of John the Baptist foretold Luke 1, 5 through 25. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abiah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring to you this good news. And behold, you will be silent, and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And all the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. That not only did you send Jesus, but Lord, you sent John the Baptist. You prepared his parents. You prepared the people as you prepare us today. Or as I pray, I pray that you prepare our hearts to receive your word from your scripture. May your Holy Spirit do the works that only he can do in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So before we jump into scripture, the children can go ahead and uh, go to children's church this morning. Do we have to have the slides? So as I was reading and preparing for today, the theme of preparation kept on coming to my mind. Preparation. God was preparing Zechariah and Elizabeth, preparing them well before the angel appeared in the temple. We know that they're, from the scripture they were, Elizabeth was barren for her entire life her entire life at this point. It was a, a very difficult time for her. We know at the end of the verses that were just read, it, she had, there was this reproach among her people because it's the expectation, and unfortunately haven't learned too much over 2,000 years, what's the expectation of the follower of God? You get married and you have kids. Is that correct? Whether it ought to be the expectation or not, uh, whether you're, you're single or married, it doesn't matter as long as you're obedient to the Lord. In fact, I'm pretty sure Paul said it's better for you to remain what? Single. 
Yeah, it's very free humane, unmarried. Why? Because, all right, Nicole, okay, we just had the premarital counseling, don't listen to this. You know, but there are difficulties in marriage, are there not? We love our spouse, but when you have two people coming together, sometimes it isn't always like this. Sometimes it's more grinding, and not intentionally out of animosity necessarily, but there's just two different people created in the image of God, but with different perspectives on life. And so it's following that, you know, we ought to, you know, whether they're married or single, not push people to marriage. If they're married and don't have kids, there could be a multitude of reasons, and it's not up to us as the church whether they have kids. Yes, there's the be fruitful and multiply, but we could be fruitful and multiply in making disciples, can we not? The Apostle Paul, he had spiritual children, like Timothy. There's many ways to, for us to be fruitful and multiply in case, but we are all called to make disciples. But going back to preparation, so Luke starts out his, his book. He wanted Theophilus to know these things so he could be sure of what he's heard. So he starts out with Zechariah and Elizabeth. If you go to Matthew, it starts out with the genealogy. Going back to Abraham. An interesting way to start off a gospel message. To talk about the genealogy. And part of it, at least what the Lord was speaking to my heart this week, Preparation. Jesus isn't a new idea. 2,000 years ago, Jesus wasn't a new idea. The Lord didn't wake up one day and say, oh, pickles, what am I going to do with these people? Man, we got this. We got, some things are getting a little bit out of hand here in this culture. These, this Roman government, is just, they're, they're ruining things. My people aren't listening to me. Uh, sometimes things don't change over thousands of years. There's still, there's still troubles with government because they're run by people. There's still run, problems with religion because they're run by people. Do we have the heart for God? So God has been preparing from time past to have, preparing to have Jesus to come in, to have his Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, to take on flesh. God has sovereignly been preparing the way for his promised Messiah ever since his promises were face, first made to Abraham and later David. He doesn't give up on his promises. So today is preparation. Last week we talked about new beginnings, and this is a new beginning for the people. We're going to have this new covenant uh, coming roughly 35 years after these, uh, these things happen. God's into preparation. God's preparing us before we even knew him. You know, for some of us raised in the church, raised in a Christian family, raised always knowing Christ, God's been preparing us as we we're children. Others of us, uh, we come to Christ later in life. But I firmly believe God's hand is on us that entire time. There's many things that helped bring me to the Lord, uh, but one of them was a couple of friends I had. I saw them only a couple times a year growing up, but they were good friends. It was neat. When we got together, it was as if nothing uh, of my life in Massachusetts mattered. We just, our friendship, because quickly we came back together. We had friends, friendship. It was a wonderful, uh, peaceful, pure, wonderful time. And then later growing up, when I started spending time with Rachel and her friends, the first time she invited me over to go and spend time with her friends at the pool, and we were just having this wonderful, pure time. They were telling innocent jokes. I ruined that. Um, they were having fun in the pool. I didn't ruin that. We're having, you know, playing silly little games like you play in the pool as an eight-year-old. But the thing, being around her, her friends who were followers of Christ, they had been reborn by the Holy Spirit, they behaved differently than my drinking buddies. There was this purity there. There was this, like, wow, this is what I've been looking for. And immediately my mind goes back to Danny and Christy, uh, this, you know, this, these friendships that I've wanted, these relationships and people these, that I've wanted. You see, God had been preparing my heart to draw me to him, even though even during the times he knew I'd rebel, I would say dumb, stupid, foolish things. And that's just one part. And I'm sure you can look back at your lives, and I would encourage you to look at the, God's hand on your life and how he's been preparing how he's been drawing, what he's been doing. And God's years of preparation aren't over. Another thing that struck out before we go dig deeper into this text, Elizabeth and Zechariah, are they young or older? Yeah, they're, they're not older, they're, they're just old. <laughs> scripture even says, that's not our judgment, that's what Scripture says. A little bit more polite with, with Elizabeth, that she was beyond the age of, of childbearing or something along those lines. What about Abraham and Sarah? Old. What about Moses? 
old. You see, our effectiveness in ministry isn't dictated by our age. Well, actually, I think it kind of is because God desires for us to grow up, to mature, but it's not a point where, all right, I finally reach this age, I get to 60, 70, 80, 90, whatever. All right, I can go ahead and the Lord doesn't need me anymore. The Lord can't possibly use me anymore. He wants to continue to use you. He wants you to, to pour into that generation before you, or perhaps two or three generations down, depending on where you are, if you have multiple generations uh, that are around. He wants to use us. He's preparing us our whole lives to be able to use us. And there's you know, pluses and minuses to each generation. We don't have to argue about those. Uh, one benefit of the millennial generation, they want that, uh, that, those relationships from so old people. Not everybody. There's exceptions to every rule. But they want, to be, they want to be poured into. They want older people uh, to come alongside who are more experienced. Uh, so God wants to use whatever preparation, whatever you're going through right now. It's not, we don't want to necessarily chalk it up to, well, the world is broken. I guess I just got to deal with it. The world is broken. But what does God want to use? Uh, what does God want to do because of it? We're going to see in here, God does, he, he does a multitude of things through a single situation. As we'll see, we, we heard with Zechariah, why was he made mute? Disbelief. disbelief. Yeah, he didn't believe. But was it, just, was it just disciplinary and just punitive, or did it have extra impacts? Extra impacts. It impacted everybody else. So while the, the, the primary number one reason was this, but God knows all these different circumstances. He knows exactly how it's going to impact people, and he's so perfect in everything. Unlike us, we can only see limited. Well, if I dam up this, this river here, it'll give us electricity, but what are going to be the repercussions for the migrating fish? Roger, what's going to happen with our migrating fish if we dam up the river? <laughs> Bad things probably, right? But we don't know all of it. How much is going to flood? We don't, we don't know everything. We know a little bit. But God, in all of our circumstances, he's doing wonderful, awesome, amazing things. He knows how the repercussions that we're not even going to know about in our lives. So we can trust him. I think we're familiar with James chapter 1, Jesus' brother talking about, uh, the, uh, talking about rejoicing in sufferings. I like Romans 5. It's basically the same thing, but from Paul. Paul knows a thing or two about suffering. And he says basically what Jesus' brother, who I'm, I'm sure Jesus' brother, half-brother, he knew about suffering. Seeing his own brother die on the cross. Being betrayed. Seeing how the, the early church was, was treated. Paul says, Romans 5, 3 says, not only this, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And that hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. So suffering is a preparation. We can have joyful, wonderful things of preparation. We can have, we can have our educational experiences. We can have our disciple-making uh, interactions as wonderful blessings. It's not just tough stuff. But when we grow, it, it, it involves a stretching. It involves exercising spiritual muscles just like our regular muscles. If we just lay there, we atrophy. If we just eat chips, we get a little rounder. It, it doesn't help us physically. There needs to be some sort of uh, exercise, some sort of... Toughness. Going back to our scriptures, I think, all right, so we got this. So starting in verse 5, I won't read it all we've had. Thank you guys. Once again, appreciate you reading that for us. But kind of setting up here, verses 5 through 7, God's sovereign preparation of Zechariah and Elizabeth. So he sets the stage. We have uh, the reign of King Herod going on here, approximately 37 to, to 4 B.C., this time frame going on. Uh, he doesn't play a significant role right here. But we know he will play a significant role when Jesus is born. We have here Zechariah. His name means uh, Jehovah has remembered. An interesting name, meaning name. God hasn't forgotten about Zechariah, this wonderful uh, priest. What do we see here? What does the scripture tell us about Zechariah? Well, he's a priest. He's of uh, the, the division of Abiah, and he has a wife who's also a daughter of Aaron. So they're both descendants of Aaron. They're of the, the right chosen family. They're what? They're righteous before the Lord. 
They walk blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes. They're, 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 they're doing all the right things. They have the right heart for God. But unfortunately, Elizabeth was, was barren and advanced in years. So there's this, there's this problem, there's this difficulty, there's this struggle that they're enduring in spite of their faithfulness to God. So we want to be careful when bad things happen to not necessarily attribute that towards sin or disobedience. I think it's good for us to explore our hearts when that happens. All right, Lord, is there something I've done here that I need to look at myself, examine myself? Is there a reason why? We want to be very careful. When mudslides happen, is that because God is punishing uh, a certain area of the county? When hurricanes strike, is that because God is punishing a certain people? And it's very easy to fall into these, these thoughts when the hurricane hit us in Florida. And so you have this one house is basically spared. These other people in the church, man, their house is destroyed and ours is kind of okay. All right, so, and you try to connect the dots. All right, so let me try to, if I can understand the sin of all these people. And just, God's quickly just saying, stop. Isn't, you can't always do one plus one and try to figure these things out. And there's all sorts of, why does all this nonsense happen? You know, sometimes the Lord has much deeper, bigger things going on. What was Job's big problem? Why did he get punished? He didn't, did he? Saying, what was God trying to do to Satan? He's trying, to, he's trying to prove, he said, no, I'll show you, I got a good guy. So imagine if some, I like to think of it sometimes, well, maybe God wants to use me to prove Satan wrong. I don't know, perhaps it's a little prideful of a thought, but, but it's not completely out of context. It's not completely out of Scripture. You know, sometimes he, he's trying to prove Satan. He'll, he'll remain faithful no matter what you do. He's going to remain faithful to me. Yeah, so for God's glory. It's pretty, pretty awesome, and they're preparing just all this other wonderful stuff. So God is preparing. We have this priest. What's the role of the priest there? They're basically to, to represent the people before God. They offer various sacrifices prescribed by the law. The sacrificing at the altar, worship in the in the shrine, some of their secondary things. They 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 bless the people. They're there to determine the will of God, instruct the people in the law of God. They have these different uh, roles that they have here. And there's quite a few. There's roughly eighteen thousand priests. I don't know. That's at least one of the numbers. Do we know? Uh, I'm sure somebody did sometime. Maybe I don't know. But they, they're spread out all over the nation, so there's just 48 cities with, with these priests, so that way they can offer their incense, they can be there as a representative uh, of God and for the people to God, and so that was Zechariah's role. But they weren't blessed with a child, and have here written down, God is, God is clearly preparing the way so that the world would know that the baby to be born from him, be born from Elizabeth, would be from him. God was clearly making a way so, so that way the community would take notice. God wants, God's been basically silent for about 400 years. Obviously, he's not silent, but we don't have any scripture uh, from those time periods. We don't know exactly what's going on, but he's, so he's about to wake up in a big way. Not that God was ever asleep, but he's about to, uh, so people can know it's going to be hard to not know that Jesus is coming. And he starts with these Jewish leaders. He starts with these priests. God is sovereignly preparing the preparers to prepare the one that would prepare the way for the Savior of the world. I think I have enough preparation in there. I was excited to think who's preparing. Anyways, we'll move on here. So now verse 8. God is sending his, his messenger to his sovereignly chosen messenger. So we have here now, Zechariah says that while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the table, the temple of the Lord, and burn incense. And as we know, with some roughly 18, 20,000 priests, they're there two weeks a year because they got 48 of them. They go for one week at a time. And so, you know, they, they get to go through. And so they're there two weeks out of the year. Uh, this would be once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to enter into the temple and to burn the incense before God. Burn the incense in this incense representing the prayers of the people being lifted up to God. What a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. What a wonderful time. Started 24 divisions in 48 cities. Twice a year they get to go there. So this wonderful opportunity, this once in a lifetime, and God sovereignly selects for this specific time. 
for Zechariah to appear to go before him. And so with this setting we have, verse 10 says, the whole multitude of people were praying outside the hour of incense. So there's twice a day going on here. We have the, the priests and some of the, uh, some of the other people out there. And while he's there, what's going on? There appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing at the right, the right hand, the right side of the altar of incense. And of course, Zechariah was, was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. Uh, what's going on here? There's... Oh, this is certainly unexpected, especially if God hasn't, you know, God hasn't been appearing to the prophets as they, as they had in times past. But here he is before a messenger of God. And you can only imagine, oh no, what's going on here? I mean, we can, even I think the most righteous person in the world, what did Paul say about himself? I'm not saying he's the most righteous, but he said he was the chief of all sinners. So imagine you and I in front of face-to-face -face with the messenger of God. Our natural reaction is going to be going through, uh-oh, oh no, these other things going on in our minds. But so he, say, he sees uh, this one angel. I love the, the uh, imagery on the right hand of the, of the altar. This right side in Scripture talks about different things. We've got the, the side that speak of their power. So the right hand of the altar, God's power, this place of honor is the right hand side. The patriarchal blessings were given with the right hand. Oaths were accompanied by the right hand. So all this coming together, you have God's incredible power to overcome a, a biological impossibility of Elizabeth becoming pregnant. This place of, of honor uh, that's going to be bestowed upon Zechariah and his family. These blessings, what an amazing blessing. Not only is a child a blessing, but imagine having uh, the child who's going to prepare the way for the king of kings. What an amazing blessing. And this promise he's about to give him. How awesome is this? But the, the, this trouble, this, it says that fear just fell upon him, which is natural. There's that one song, you know, what will I do on face to face with you, Lord? I'm, I can't sing it well. I probably should have written down the lyrics. But, you know, I think we're all going to fall down on our knees. We're not going to dance for joy. I mean, it will be a joyful time to be in the presence of God. But to be there with this perfect, awesome God and knowing that our lives have been perhaps slightly less than perfect. What an amazing experience that's going to be, but what a, just a humbling time. Revelation 21 tells us that, that when the new heaven and new earth are created, uh, that God's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. This isn't uh, the, the next second after death he wipes our tear from our eyes, so there's going to be some tears in our eyes. There's going to be some regret. I wish I'd shared the gospel with this person. I wish I had done this. But God, fortunately, he's powerful enough to overcome all of our uh, disabilities, our insecurities, our shortcomings in life. So the angel responds uh, to him, to Zechariah, uh, to get these wonderful promises. He says, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. What awesome, wonderful news. You shall call his name, his name John. What a great, wonderful promise. So, I mean, he could stop there, and I'm sure Zechariah and Elizabeth would be, uh, they'd love it, but he has so much more for them. He says, you're going to have joy and gladness. Perhaps you have different translations, might have a different word than gladness. Uh, this is more than just kind of simple happiness. It's, it means exaltation, this extreme joy, this extreme gladness. So you have joy, which is independent of circumstances. I'm sure they were joyful being childless, joy coming from the Lord. But this extreme gladness that not only do they have a child, but this wonderful child is going to do wonderful things for the world. This extreme gladness, this rejoicing, this happy heart because of the richness of their, their blessing, that God has answered their prayers. They've actually, he's, God has chosen them and done all these wonderful things. Extreme joy, they're going to witness the hearts of many in Israel turning back to God. Imagine getting to witness revival here in America. Came to witness revival here in, in Joyce. There's a lot of hurting people here. A lot of lost people here. Unfortunately, we, I'm not saying we, but you know, as a culture, the culture isn't helping them. Culture isn't providing any, any answers. So, of course, they're going to turn to dispensaries on every corner. Not sure. Are there more dispensaries than liquor stores here in Clallam County? I'm not sure. 
It's not helping. You know, when we self-medicate, it, it doesn't help things. But we have, we have true help here with Scripture. Imagine seeing that here. People coming back. Many will rejoice uh, like you all. He will, bring, he will be great before the Lord. Imagine that promise. Your, your, your child is going to be great. There's the hopes we have as, as parents. Man, I hope my child is great. I, I, I hope, and it's not even a no-so hope. You know, scripture talks about hope as followers of Christ. Who we have this great blessed hope of being with, with God. There's this no-so hope. As parents, man, I hope what I do is the right thing to lead them towards the Lord. I hope what I do, what I do raises them up. I hope uh, what, what I preach on Sunday is going to be a blessing to people that the Holy Spirit can use. We have lots of hopes, but not always assurances. We have this messenger from God speaking directly to Zechariah saying he will be great before the Lord. It says he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be uh, filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So this not drinking so, the, the strong drink or the wine, I think it's kind of, it, it's this semi-Nazarene vow reminiscent of it. Obviously he's not telling him to make this Nazarene vow or else there will be other commands in there. But the essence of the Nazarene vow, if you look back to Numbers, if you look at Numbers chapter 6, after each of these commands, it says, or before, it says to separate himself to the Lord. So to separate yourself to the Lord, you're going to do this, abstain from these hard drinks. To separate yourself to the Lord, you're going to let your hair uh, go ahead and grow long. To separate yourself to the Lord. So this is just, I think it, it's, it's connecting that John has already been separated to the Lord. And once again, God's hand on all this, God's hand is, is so much bigger than all this. Whether people, as we interact uh, at the tree lighting on Friday or throughout the year, throughout the month, whether they believe what we say about Scripture, it doesn't, it matters for them, but it doesn't not make it true. God has been doing this from eternity past, so to separate themselves. Um, oftentimes, it, I believe this was every time the priest would abstain from strong drink prior to entering the tabernacle. Why? Because it's, it's that way. It, it's, just, it's about between uh, them and the Lord. It, there's no, the, as we know, you know, alcohol and other drugs, they can have other effects on us. That's why, that's why people drink. They, you know, sometimes, you know, what is it, liquid courage or whatever they call it, the social lubricant. Well, no, it's about connecting with the Lord here. We have these radical elements in God's appearance and behavior may exemplify his radical message of repentance for the people. And the Spirit's control over the control that wine can have. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, even in, even in his mother's womb. That's pretty awesome. As a church, and so I, I encourage you, I probably should have said this at the beginning, but I encourage us as we, we're going to go through this Christmas series, this Christmas narrative, and for most of us, this will probably be the 30th, 40th, 50th time we've either heard or read this. If, you, if it's not, then that's wonderful, but I encourage us to listen to this with fresh hearts. Not, okay, well, I know this, and I know that's not a slight against me, that just could be our, not, okay, I know, let's, let's move to something I don't, you know, I don't know, but let's hear what does the Lord want to hear, what does he want to speak to us? And in that, sometimes we miss, well, he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Well, that's new. Our children aren't built, born filled with the Holy Spirit. They're born with the fleshly nature. They're born with the old self. But man, from, the, from his mother's womb, even back then, the, the Holy Spirit wasn't a given for the believer. It was, a, it was for a, a, a selected person for a selected period of time. The prophets would have the Holy Spirit. So once again, hey, pay attention to this guy. He'll turn the hearts of many children of Israel to their Lord, their God. What an awesome, awesome sight and sound. He will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready the Lord for the Lord a people prepared. John wasn't the one, but he was preparing the people for the one. And so these, these couple of statements, these last ones, would have registered in Zechariah's mind, looking at Ma Malachi 3, Malachi 4. Saying the exact same thing, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Malachi 4, Behold, I send, send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. 
You'll turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the hearts of the children to their, to their fathers. And so whether this is a partial fulfillment and there's going to be a greater fulfillment later, or whether it was completely fulfilled in John the Baptist, there's different um, people that argue one way or another. I'm not exactly, exactly sure, but there's going to be heart transformation going on here. John, John the Baptist, this repentance, this changing of heart. And so with that, as people change their hearts, there's going to be, you're going to see these things going on with the restoration between families, these different things going on here. People turn their hearts to disobedience to wisdom of the just. Our world needs to turn back to the wisdom of the just. But it's not new, is it? 2,000 years ago, same problem. 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. Cain and Abel, they could use a little bit of wisdom. At least one of those guys in the garden. So making bad decisions isn't new. Making heart prepared. And then next, uh, verse 18, we get this disciplinary sign. Zechariah says to the angel, how should I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And it's interesting. This is very similar, is it not, to what Mary says? So sometimes, so, so what's going on here? Why is Zechariah a disobedient guy, but Mary, what, what's going on here? Mary says, well, how, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Zechariah says, how shall I know this? Very similar statements. I think it's all about the heart. The angel knew what was the heart. The God revealed to the angel this, uh, this disbelief. How will I know this? How will I, uh, how will I really know this fully, fully believe that this is the case? And he has human reason to be apprehensive. Well, how, how can I know this? How can I know this to, to be true? He doesn't... He, he, he quite honestly doesn't believe. And I believe that Mary, um, whether that's a blessing of her uh, not being advanced in her years, not being, you know, seen a lot of things, whatever the case may be, I think she was just, all right, Lord, I have no idea how this is going to happen, but I, I trust you this is going to happen. Anybody have those times? Lord, it seems like you're promising this. I have no idea how it's going to take place, but Lord, you're going to do it. And that, that, that's Mary's attitude. Zechariah's, are you sure about that? And we want to be very careful about having those attitudes because we have obviously a finite perspective on things. And the angel in his response, well, how should I know this? The angel kind of, he starts answering. He says, well, well, hey, I'm the angel Gabriel. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. Are you, know, kind of, are you standing in the presence of God right now? You may be standing in the presence of these priests, these these." Hopefully godly men, we know Jesus comes, they're not making the right decisions, the best decisions. But hey, you can trust me because of who I am, who I spend time with. Uh, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. I was sent from God to you. That's how you can trust this message to be true. Which I think he believed. I imagine, you know, yeah, that makes sense. And he continues on, verse 20, Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. And as I mentioned, being in the message, it, it's not so that way the people, his, it doesn't say here the primary was so that way the people would know. He says, because you did not believe my words. You didn't trust what I say of true, will be true, which will be fulfilled in their time. This will happen, but you're going to be unable to speak. I said, it's just wonderful. We see God has his wonderful manifold ways of using John's discipline far beyond a simple uh, correction of his faith, but to reach the hearts of others, the priests, the people around. That's why it's so important for us that Proverbs 3, uh, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding. We have such a limited understanding. All right, Lord, what are you trying to do here? He might not tell us, but just trust, all right, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm trusting you with this. He gives us all those opportunities. He can work things far but better out. He can do far more, far more things. I don't know, sure, why you want me to say this. I can't remember if I told you. The, the key phrase that led me to Christ, 
the elder at the church sharing the gospel with me. He said, are you ready to accept Christ? Now I said, no, I'm not. So for you guys in the back, that was at a Calvary Chapel in, Mel- in Melbourne, Florida. So Calvary Chapel, they get the save. Uh, Rachel does not get the save. Um, but he said, are you, ready to accept, are you ready to trust the Lord? I said, no, I'm not. He said, well, what's holding you back? I said, I don't know everything yet. And so his incredibly deep theological answer was, you'll never know everything. Which is true. He says, so when he said that, oh, okay. At least that's okay, well, that makes, okay, I'm ready to accept the Lord. He continued talking for five minutes. I have no idea what he said, and that's not to his, you know, anything, but just, that's all that was needed. Okay. For my scientific intellectual mind, I need to know everything. I'm not going to know everything. I mean, I'm used to knowing everything as a meteorologist and getting everything right. (laughs) It might rain today, guys, so you might want to have some boots on today. You're welcome. But it doesn't always take the profound things. It doesn't, God knows what he's doing. So even in the punishment, it was his blessing far beyond anything, and he's going to use it with the birth of John and coming out. It's just, it just so awesome when God is doing things, when God is at work, when God is preparing. God is going to do far beyond what we could think, ask, or even imagine. So verse 21, as the people were waiting for Zechariah, they were wondering at his delay in the temple. Because I imagine this is more than just, right, he lit the incense, he, he made a little prayer, and then came back out. There was this time going on here. He came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. They knew that he had experienced God in that temple. God was using that. So hey, they're, are they going to pay attention now to Zechariah? There's lots of priests now. They're going to be paying extra. What, what's going on? I need to watch this guy. Think that could have been part of God's plan all along? Well, we need to watch this guy. Let's see what's going to happen here. And he kept making signs to him remain mute. Uh, but his time of service ended and he went home. They're going to be watching in verse 24. We end this section. It says, After these days his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my approach, reproach from my people. She's just sitting in, uh, absorbing the wonderful blessing. I think it was just icing on the cake that, wow, the, the stature and nature of who John is going to be, which is, wow, that God will give me this son. Just enjoying it, just like uh, Mary, we see over and over again. What did she do? She treasured these things in her heart. She pondered these things in her heart. She treasured. She absorbed all these things. So she absorbed and she praised as we uh, praise this morning for for Chuck and his his, his healing. We want to make sure that we are are praising people for what the Lord has done and is doing in our lives. So as we close our uh, final thought here, just a big idea. You might have to scroll all the way to the last slide. There's about 10 slides in between here and there. But just, we want to remain faithful. God is preparing us. There's going to be the temptation, especially when things go awry, to just uh, do all sorts of things. But we want to remain faithful. God prepares futures beyond what we can imagine. Yeah. Amen. That's, what, that's just what he does. Remain faithful. Zechariah and Elizabeth, they remain faithful. Despite not receiving the blessing, That I'm sure at times it felt like, Lord, what gives? Why is everybody else able to have a child? You know, sometimes you ever look around and, you know, it seems like some people, you know, how, how are these people able to have a child? But Lord, why have you withheld the blessing from these people over here who are following you? And yet, you know, I'm not, you know, bashing anybody who's 15 years old, but Lord, they're 15, they're, not, they're still in high school, they're not even, you know... It was a one-night thing, but why are they having a child but this wonderful, loving Christian couple who seeks to glorify and honor you? We don't want to let our circumstances dictate our faithfulness to God. Remain faithful. God was preparing the hearts of Zechariah and Elizabeth. He was preparing them his entire, their entire lives. God was preparing the way for John the Baptist to come in. So when he knows, he came first to those leaders, those priests, those people that are coming, and they were going to know about John the Baptist. God's preparing the, the Jewish priests and people. And God's preparing the way for 
John the Baptist to prepare the, the way for, for Jesus. I love how throughout all this narrative, God isn't secret or silent about all this. And I love the book of Luke. Um, the, he just, in, in Luke, he one of his themes is kind of the, almost the down and out. It's not the, the high upper class. Okay, yes, he was the priest. But my guess is with the pregnancy struggles, they're probably low on the totem pole. At least she said uh, she had a reproach among the people. Mary and Joseph, the, the lowly shepherds. I know this is Matthew, but you know, God was, he wants to make sure everybody knows he went to the wise men who were, were far off in the east. God wants the world to know about his king. God went through a lot of effort, and he, he wants us, I would encourage us that this Advent, this Christmas season, to, uh, to lean into those opportunities with those around you as God opens the door. Pray for God to open those doors. Pray for God to give you the words to say. I've heard it said, well, we'll, we'll talk about that later. I don't want to unpack the, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll, never mind, I'll say it. So you want to go in like you're, uh, go into evangelism like you're an Arminian and walk, in, walk out as a Calvinist. So walk in Arminian so that way, you know what, I can change the world, I can say whatever, and it's going to change their heart, but then walk out as a complete Calvinist. God, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. I can do nothing here. So kind of be a little, a little bipolar Share what's on God's heart. If you share what's on your heart, I know from experience, you can walk out, even if they completely reject everything you've said. Lord, I, I've, I've, done, I've been obedient. I've been faithful. And God knows how to be faithful with his part. Let him do his part. Let's pray, and the worship team's going to close us out with Emmanuel one more time, just for Steve. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for how you have prepared us individually. You've prepared us collectively. We thank you for your hand <coughs> on Joyce Bible Church. These decades now. I pray as we enter into this Christmas, this Advent season, a time where we love to give gifts and love to love one another, we don't forget to love you the most. Lord, prepare our hearts for the people that we're going to get to interact with this week. They're not by accident. They're there on purpose. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remain, remain faithful to you, even if things don't go the way that we would have orchestrated in this world. We know that you do things exceedingly better than we could ask, think, or even imagine. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts. In the spirit of preparation, let's prepare for his coming.
Lord, send us out in your grace and your truth, knowing that you are truly with us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so we may impact this community. And Lord, I pray as the rains come and the winds come, may you protect us. But even more so, may you use these rains that come to draw more to yourself. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.